In the last lecture, we discussed about one port networks and the theorems associated with them, Thevenin's and Norton's theorem to be more precise. We also talked about Thevenin equivalence and Norton equivalence for one port networks and how you could use them to analyze certain circuits. Today we are going to talk about two port networks. Now what exactly are two port networks? To understand that, let me point out that many, many circuits are best understood in terms of an input-output paradigm. That is, uh, you have a port, which is a pair of terminals, where you give an input, and there's another port, another pair of terminals, where you take the output from. Now, it's not always true that all circuits have this clear-cut uh, identification of this, these two terminals as input and those two terminals as output. And sometimes it might even happen that the roles might get mixed up. But in many situations, it's easy to identify an input per port and an output port. A two-port network uh, or the two-port network theorems that we will talk about are exactly used in such situations. So, now, depending on the choice of the independent or controlling quantities, we can classify different kinds of two-port equivalent circuits. When I say controlling quantities, what I really mean are basically the currents or voltages that are there in each of the ports. Now, depending on which ones of them you choose as independent, parameters and which ones you choose as depending on them, you get different kinds of two-port equivalent circuits as I said and three of the most common and essentially these are all that you have except for a few special modifications which we may discuss later. The three most common ones are the Z parameter equivalent circuits, the Y parameter equivalent circuits, also known respectively as impedance equivalent circuits and admittance equivalent circuits respectively and finally the H parameter equivalent circuits also known as the hybrid parameter equivalent circuits. Now in most of the, the scenarios that we will use them in these are used essentially for small signal or AC circuit analysis. Now many of you may be unaware of what these terms small signal analysis AC analysis, etc. mean. Since we are going to use these terms and the associated terminologies quite often in the rest of this lecture, and we'll we will definitely use them very often in later lectures, it is perhaps important to explain a bit about what this means. And to explain this, I am making use of this circuit that you see in front of you. Uh, this may be very familiar to some of you because this is a standard workhorse in electronics or at least it used to be until it was sort of superseded by other more modern circuits recently. This is a CE or common emitter amplifier circuit which uses a transistor. Um, we will discuss this in some detail in a later video so that you will definitely know much more about this circuit if you don't know it already. But what I want you to focus on is not the details of this circuit. That's not important for the rest of this lecture. What is important is that you can see that in this circuit there are certain voltage supplies. You see there's a VCC equals 12 volts. There's a zero volts. That really means that you're connecting a battery, a 12 volt battery between this point marked zero volts and this point marked VCC. Okay. Now, this battery is essential for the circuit to work. But on top of all this, you also have a signal, a signal which comes in here. It's a sinusoidal input signal, denoted V in. And it's, it is this signal which the amplifier is supposed to amplify and produce this thing we call V out here. So, you put a sinusoidal signal here, you will have a signal on the output. And that is what we would want to analyze if we were to analyze this particular circuit. And we will analyze this circuit using the two-port network theorems in a later video, not in this one. However, 
let me point out one thing. Because I have already put in a battery here and there are resistances in this circuit which carries currents and so on, and in fact the currents are also indicated here as ICC, which essentially comes in from this battery. The notation, if you don't understand this right now, don't worry. This will be clear once we talk about the C amplifier later. But what happens in this circuit is that even in the absence of a signal, even if this V in were set to zero, there would be a voltage at this point, a 12 volt voltage. There would be currents going through these circuits. There would be a voltage here. And so V out will have a non-zero voltage even without a signal. And this non-zero voltage and the currents that are established in the circuit even without a signal, these are very, very important for the circuit to work. Why? We are going to explain that later. If you do, don't know how transistors function, it may be a bit difficult to talk about it right now. Don't worry, we will definitely talk about this in some detail later. But what is important for you to realize is that even if you do not have a signal, this circuit will have voltages and currents. And these voltages and currents, which are there, without signals are called quiescent point voltages and currents. Quiescent simply means sleeping in some sense. It's as if the signal comes and wakes the circuit up. Until then, the circuit is sleeping. But even at the sleeping stage, it has voltages and currents established at different parts. Um, very often, although not always, this circuit would be disturbed by a signal which is periodic in time. Okay, So what you have is some voltage which is there even without the signal and just to clarify about the terminology, these voltages and currents are called quiescent point voltages and currents. They are also often referred to as mean voltages and currents uh, or average vol voltages or currents, steady state voltages or currents. Many such terms are used, but all these really point to one thing. The signal typically is a periodic signal which averages to zero. You might say, why average to zero? The answer is if it did not average to zero, you could just take that average value as part of this mean or quiescent point value. So you could include the average in the quiescent point value and talk of the rest as a signal. This is why the quiescent point voltages and currents are often referred to as mean voltages and currents. The signal is supposed to have an average of zero. So the average of the entire voltage is what the steady state value is. And what we often do is we talk of the signal as an AC signal. Why? Because Fourier's uh, series or Fourier's theorem has taught us that any periodic signal can be thought of as a sum of lots of sines and cosines. And also a constant, but the constant is the average value which we have just now said is zero. So because the signal is typically a sum of lots of sines and cosines, which are what we have in AC signals, we very often talk of the signal as AC. So what we usually have is a quiescent point voltage of currents or mean voltage of currents. And on top of that, we have an AC signal. So this is terminology. And this is the terminology we are going to follow in the rest of the lecture. Uh, mathematically, as you will soon see, what we are going to use is Taylor series, which works even when the signal is not an AC. But we will be using a truncated version of Taylor series. So it will work only if the signal is small in some sense. But although the mathematics will work, even if the signal is not a sinusoidal signal or a combination of sinusoidal signals, we often just use the terminology of short, small signal AC uh, analysis to describe this because that is the most common situation where this is used. So with this background, let me just take a look at the most common uh, two-port equivalent circuits or two-port two -port equivalent networks.
the voltages and currents that are already there in steady state are the ones which we actually don't want to worry about in small signal analysis. What we are thinking about is that a signal which comes into an amplifier causes fluctuations around these bias values and as a result of the input fluctuation, the output also fluctuates. So when we think of something like an amplification produced by a transistor circuit, we are really asking ourselves, if the input fluctuates by this much, how much does the output fluctuate? So these are the situations where small signal analysis or AC analysis becomes very important. So as we will soon see, there is a very simple mathematical meaning to all that I have been saying right now. So just, let's just go ahead and inspect that. And as in the case of one port networks, the basic paradigm in a two port network scenario also is that of a black box. But here it's a black box with two ports sticking out, uh, port one and port two. I've drawn port one on the left and port two on the right. And very often port one is going to be re referred to as an input port and port two as an output port. But as I said, you could choose any two ports in your circuit to be port one and port two. So although they're used most often in the context when port 1 is a place where you apply a, an input and port 2 is where you take the output from, that's not necessarily the case for every situation where you're using uh, two port network analysis. You just need two ports sticking out of a black box. Now there will be currents at the two ports, I1 and I2 respectively. There will also be voltages across the two ports, V1 and V2. Now one important thing to notice here is that, that the convention we use, and that's just a sign convention, is that currents are taken to be positive if they're flowing in to the black box and on the upper terminal of each port. Uh, this actually is opposite to what we used in the one port network scenarios when we were talking of Thevenin's theorem or Norton's theorem their current going out was considered to be positive or rather I was that we used there was the current going out. If it is positive then it was going out. If it was negative then it was going in. Here the situation is just the opposite. That again is just a convention. It's just universally used that currents flowing into the black box are considered to be positive. And also again we are using an established sign convention about V1 and V2. V1 is positive when the upper terminal is higher in potential than the lower terminal. Similarly for V2. Now, the most important thing that we have here is, in almost all circuits that we will talk about, all the four quantities V1, V2, I1, I2 will never be independent. And in almost all circuits we talk about, uh, two of these will be independent. Now which two? Often it doesn't really matter. Often it, you could take any two, but the most common choices and very often they're dictated by circuit realities rather than just being artificial choices. The most common choices are things like, okay, there are in fact three common choices. So there are three kinds of uh, two port equivalent circuits because of that. So depending on which which two are chosen to be independent, you get different equivalent circuits. In particular, if we choose I1 and I2 as independent, then this leads to what is called the Z parameter equivalent circuit. So how this goes along is as follows. We are choosing I1, I2 as independent. That means V1 and V2 will both be chosen as functions of I1, I2. Okay, let me uh, point out the convention here. I am using capital V1, capital V2 for the voltages, capital I1, capital I2 for the currents. These are the total values of the voltage. Okay, So the capital letters here denote the total values of the voltages across each port and the current flowing in the upper terminal of each port. Of course, a part of this voltage would usually be the quiescent point value or the bias value, the value which is there always. 
because of some circuit parameters, there is some value which is already there. And remember we said we are going to talk usually about variation from that value. The variations we will denote by small letters. So, capital V1 is the value of the voltage as a whole. Small V1 would be the fluctuation of capital V1 about the cuisine point or the bias point value. That is going to be very important in what we are going to see. Okay, so given that V1 and V2 are functions of I1 and I2, we can of course ask ourselves what happens if we were to change I1, I2 from the mean cuisine point bias values. Uh, these words mean cuisine point bias are being used interchangeably here. They essentially mean the same thing. There is some average value for currents I1, 0 and I2, 0. And of course, because of this average value, there will be an average value of the voltages as well. We are asking how much does V1 change from that value, that average value, when I1 and I2 changes from their respective average values. And that is easy. All you have to do is use Taylor's theorem. This of course is an approximation. So, when I1 and I, I1 changes from I1 0, which is the I1 0 is denotes the mean value of I1. Similarly, I2 0 denotes the mean value of I2. So, when I1 and I2 changes from I1 0 and I2 0 respectively, what happens is V1 becomes approximately the value of V1 at the mean position I1 0, I2 0. There is a mean value of the voltage V1 plus a contribution which is due to the fact that I1 is changing. How much is that contribution? It's just how much has I1 deviated from the mean value I1 minus I1 0 times the rate at which V1 will change with I1 and I1 alone. The partial derivative del V1 del I1 evaluated of course at the mean point. And in addition to that you have a similar term because I2 is changing from I2 0. So you have del V1 del I2 again evaluated at I1 0 I2 0 times I2 minus I2 0. This of course is just the first order term or first order terms in the Taylor series expansion of V1. Now, notice that capital V1 minus this quantity, capital V1 at I1 0 I2 0 is precisely the fluctuation, the change in capital V1 when you change currents from the mean values. Similarly, I1 minus I1 0 is of course the deviation of I1 from its mean value which exactly is what we denote by small i1. Similarly, this quantity in the bracket here is small i2. So, it is easy to see that these equations as long as we stick to the first order only, so this is valid strictly speaking, in general only if I1 minus I0, I1 0 and I2 minus I2 0 are small quantities, what we have within the parameters of this approximation is small v1, the difference between capital v1 and capital v1 at i10, i20 is simply equal to del v1 del capital i1 evaluated at i10, i20 into small i1. Small i1 remember is nothing but capital i1 minus capital i10. We similarly have another term del v1 del capital i2 at the mean position into small i2, small i2 is capital I2 minus capital I2 0. So, this is small v1, the change in capital v1 from the mean value. And very similarly, by exactly the same analysis, we have a very similar expansion for small v2. Small v2 again is capital v2 minus capital v2 at I1 0, I2 0. And that to the first order in Taylor series is simply the derivatives of capital V2 with respect to I1 and I2 respectively times small i1 and small i2. Now, notice that in these calculations, these quantities are independent of small i1, small i2. They may of course depend on capital I1, 0, capital I2, 0 that is on the bias point. But as long as you stick to the same bias point, these are independent of other quantities 
So these are parameters, four of them, which we call the Z parameters. Now since Z is usually used for impedances, it's easy to see what, where the name Z parameter comes from because at least dimensionally, each of these derivatives are nothing but impedances, the voltage by current. And we use another simple notation for them. This coefficient here is the coefficient of I1 in the expansion of V1. We call this Z11. This one we call Z12. This one we call Z21. Similarly, this last one we call Z22. And once we do that, this is what my equations for the AC values, the fluctuations in the voltages become in terms of the currents. So, at least as long as we are sticking to small signals, small V1 and small V2 are linear combinations of small I1 and small I2. And these four parameters ZIJs are called the Z parameters of course. Fine, but these are all very nice as equations and uh, we may even be able to use these equations in calculations when we want to do a circuit analysis. But as in the case of Thevenin's theorem or Norton's theorem, it is actually much, much easier and so definitely much easier to understand if instead of leaving these as just mathematical equations, we convert them to equivalent circuits. So that after that we can analyze the whole thing using circuit analysis tricks. So how do we change this expression, say the top one here, small v1. And as long as we are within the small signal approximation, we will just ignore the fact that this is approximate. We will just say small v1 is z11 i1 plus z12 i2. Uh, well, if the circuit were linear, then this would be an exact result no matter how big i1 and i2 are. For nonlinear circuits, which is the place where we really use this machinery, there, of course, this is an approximation only valid for small i1 and small i2. Now, if you want to convert the top equation into a circuit, let's just think about it. First of all, the left hand side is a voltage. That obviously means that the two terms on the right hand side both must be voltages. And here, what we have is a voltage which is a sum of two voltages. Because a voltage is being summed here, the circuit must be, the equivalent circuit must be a series one, must be two things in series, one of them contributing Z11 I1, the other one contributing Z12 I2. Right? So, this obviously, if you look at this and use, say, Kershaw's voltage law, it's easy to see as you go along this loop, V1 is a rise, then you have Z11 I1 as a drop and Z12 I2 as a drop. So, V1 must be Z11 I1 plus Z12 I2. Fine, but these are just two blocks I have drawn with values written in there. Do we have some more physical implementation for them? The answer is yes. After all, notice that this is a drop of Z11 I1 when a current I1 is flowing into this. This obviously is an impedance Z11. If we just connect a simple impedance Z11 here, that will do the job of dropping Z11 I1. However, this term will give us a bit more trouble. This is of the form resistance into a current, but this current I2 is not the current in this lead, it's a current somewhere else. It's a current to this. Since the current I2 is not flowing in this branch at all, the only way I can get a Z1 to I2 voltage is by demanding that I put in a current controlled voltage source here. So, the way in which we implement this as an effective circuit is we have an impedance Z11 here, providing the Z11 I1 drop, since I1 is flowing through it, 
and this voltage has to be implemented by a voltage source, a controlled voltage source, where the voltage is controlled by the current flowing elsewhere, current flowing through this. So that is how uh, you write down the effective circuit for the left hand side or the input side. What about the output side? Well, it goes exactly the same way. You have Z21 I1 plus Z22 I2. Z22 I2 can be implemented by an impedance Z22. I2 is really the current flowing through that. On the other hand, Z21 I1 has to be implemented as a current controlled voltage source. A voltage source of magnitude is Z21 I1 and it depends on the current in the other branch. So the full Z parameter equivalent circuit will simply look like this. Now this line that I have drawn in between the two cells, the input cell and the output cell, is simply more of a reminder to ourselves that internally all the stuff is joined together. So it's, they are not really two separate entirely independent things. Of course, even without this line, we can see that the two sides, one and two, are not separate and independent because the voltage source is here. This voltage source on the left-hand side depends on the right-hand side current and vice versa for Z21 I1. The line is, that I have drawn here, this one line, is simply more of a convention. You can easily convince yourselves that no current will flow through that wire. So it doesn't really matter whether those two points are joined or not. Is there simply to remind you that the whole thing is really one complete piece and not not to completely independent detached pieces of circuit. So what we have here is our Z parameter equivalent circuit. We will see how to use this for a simple circuit analysis problem later. Let us quickly look at the other two equivalent circuits before that. But Okay, before we go there, we should identify the four impedances properly. Now, Z11, what is that? In order to understand this, I will have to remind you that V1 was Z11 I1 plus Z12 I2. So, if I2 is 0, when is I2 0? When the output side, the two side, is open circuit. Nothing is connected to the output terminal, no current flows there. So, I2 is 0, that's the output open condition. And if you keep I to 0, V1 will be Z11 I1. So Z11 is simply V1 by I1 with I2 equal to 0. Now what is V1 by I1? It's nothing but the input voltage by the input current. So that's the input impedance. Strictly speaking, that's an AC input impedance because V1 and I1 are not really the voltages and currents at the input, but the voltage fluctuations and current fluctuations at the input. Be that as it may, V1 by I1 is an input impedance but evaluated when i2 is zero that means this is an input impedance evaluated with the output open that's z11 what about z z12 oh let's look at z22 first that's again easy z22 is nothing but v2 by i2 with i10 so that's the output impedance with input open well z12 it's also an impedance, and it has a dimension for impedance, but it's V1 by I2 with I10. Remember V1 again is Z11 I1 plus Z12 I2. If I1 were 0, then V1 would be just the Z12 I2, and that's exactly this equation. So Z12 is an impedance, but it's a transfer impedance. That's just a technical term. All that means is that it's an impedance which relates a voltage in one place to a current somewhere else. And this is called the reverse transfer impedance because the voltage at the input is being affected by the current at the output. That's where the reverse terminology comes from. So reverse transfer impedance is simply V1 by I2. But because this is uh, V1 by I2 at I1 equal to 0, this is really reverse transfer impedance with input open. We often also call this ZR. Oh, I just forgot to mention earlier, so this was written in the slides, that Z11 is also called ZI, because ZI is simply the input impedance with output open. So ZI is input impedance, that's why the I. Similarly, Z Z22 is the output impedance 
that is also called z o reverse transfer impedance z r r for reverse of course what about z21 z21 is v2 by i1 but at i2 equal to 0 so v2 by i1 again transfer impedance but it's transferred now in the forward direction from the input to the output so this is a forward transfer impedance with output open i2 equal to 0 and this is simply called zf f for forward so very often you will see the same circuit two parameter equal circuit drawn but instead of each of the four parameters all the four parameters referred to by double indices 1 1 1 2 2 1 2 2 they are just referred to by the letters which describe their names so instead of z11 i could have zi instead of z12 which is a reverse transfer impedance i could write zr Z22 would be ZO, Z21 would be ZF. So, very often you will find the Z parameter equivalent circuit for a two port network drawn in this fashion with ZI, ZO, ZR, ZF as the four parameters. This is just an alternative labeling. Physics, of course, is exactly the same. It's just that we have chosen to use labels which reflect the names of these impedances rather than the more mathematical Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22. So, these were the Z parameter equivalents. But how do you get the Y parameter equivalents? Well, for Y parameter equivalents, what you do is you treat V1 and V2 as independent, as opposed to what you did for Z parameter. For Z parameter, you chose I1, I2 as independent. Here, we have chosen V1, V2. As independent i1 i2 is dependent on them so quickly going through the mathematics here i've already drawn the equivalence again but still let's see what kind of mathematics gives rise to that i1 and i2 will both be functions of v1 v2 and again here the mean values that we talk about are mean values of the input voltage and the output voltage which are the controlling parameters and because of that, you also get I1 and I2 at the mean values of values V10, V20 respectively. And just using the same kind of analysis that we did for the Z parameters, you will get small i1. The fluctuation is small V1 into a parameter which we call Y11, similarly Y12, V2. Small i2 will be Y21, V1 plus Y22, V2. And what are these Ys? And is dimensionally these y's are all current by voltages, so they are admittances. So this is also called the admittance equivalent. And again, how do we implement them in a circuit? You can see, of course, the implementation drawn right here. But let me just uh, explain the logic to you as to why you have this particular kind of equivalent circuit. It's pretty straightforward. Here you see, this is one current, which is the sum of two currents. So if a current is to be a sum of two terms, both of which, of course, must be currents, uh, each of these must be flowing through parallel branches. So here you must have two parallel branches. Y11, V1 is simply the current which flows through this branch. If Y11 is the admittance of this branch and V1 is the voltage drop, across this branch. That's simply Ohm's law. Uh, of course, you once again, since you may not be that familiar with using admittances all the time, let me remind you that Ohm's law says current through a branch is voltage across that branch divided by the resistance of that branch or equivalently voltage across a branch multiplied by the admittance of the branch. The admittance, of course, is just reciprocal resistance. So I1 is Y11, V1 will be the contribution from this branch. The other branch must contribute Y12, V2. But now the, the current here depends on a voltage, but it depends on a voltage across the other terminal. So this again is something you can only implement in terms of a controlled current source, a voltage controlled current source here. And how much is the voltage controlled current source magnitude? It has to be Y1 to V2. In exactly the same fashion, in order to implement the second equation, I2 equals I, Y21, Y1, V1, plus Y22, V2, we must have a parallel circuit 
on the output side as well. Y22 as an admittance, which will make current Y2 to V2 flow through that. And the rest of the current, rest of I2 must flow through the other branch, which must be a voltage controlled current source again. So this is the basics of the Y parameter equivalent. Of course, uh, the names, standard names, Y11 is going to be I1 by V1 when V2 is 0. Of course, remember once again, I1 now is Y11 V1 plus Y12 V2. If V2 is 0, it's just Y11 V1 divided by V1. Again, I1 by V1 at I2 equals 0 is Y11. Similarly, Y22 is going to be I2 by V2 at V1 equals 0. Y12 I1 by V2 at V1 equals 0 and Y21 is I2 by V1 and V2 equals 0. So what kind of names can we give them? There is the input current divided by the input voltage when V2 is 0. V2 is 0 means the output is shorted. Let me just, well, let me just explain what we mean by shorted here or what we meant by open when we talked about open circuit, open input or open output for the Z parameters. Here we don't really mean that you're putting a short across the output terminal because if you did, the overall voltage capital V2 would have vanished. What we are saying here is that the short is something called an AC short. Effectively for the AC circuit, there is no output voltage. The, that means for the overall circuit, the output voltage is fixed at whatever the mean value is. So V2 equals 0 here, we will talk about that as output shorted, but what we really mean mathematically is the output is held fixed at the constant value produced by the mean or Cuisson point voltages, input voltages. So with that proviso explained, Y11 is simply the input admittance with output shorted, Y22 is the output admittance with input shorted. Y12 and Y21 are both transfer admittances. Why? They are both admittances, of course, they are currents by voltages. But Y12, for example, is a current at the input divided by the voltage at the output. So that's a reverse transfer admittance. Y21 is a forward transfer admittance. And because of this, they also have labels, other ways of naming them. Yi for input admittance, Yo for output admittance, Yr for reverse transfer admittance, Yf for forward transfer admittance. And very often you will find these labels used in the Y parameter equivalence. So far the two equivalence circuits that we have looked at are in a sense pure circuits. The sense that I am using the word pure here is essentially this. But all the four parameters that we had in the Z parameter equivalent circuits were all impedances. Similarly, for the Y parameter equivalent circuit, all of the four parameters were admittances. Not only that, the input circuit and the output circuit were both series circuits for the Z parameter case. And here, as you can see, for the Y parameter case, they are both parallel circuits. Well, the next one is a hybrid in all senses of the word. Instead of taking two voltages, the input and output voltages as independent, as we have done here for the Y parameter equivalent, or the input and output currents as independent in the Z parameter equivalent, in the hybrid parameter equivalent, what we do is we take I1, the input current, and V2, the output put voltage as equivalent. And this leads to us to the H parameter equivalent circuit. Uh, well, since I1 and V2 have been taken to be independent, V1, the input voltage, and I2, the output current, are functions of these two in this picture. And by carrying out the same kind of analysis that we had done for the Z and the Y parameter equivalent, namely uh, expanding in a Taylor series about the mean or Cuisson point values of I10 and V20, what we get for the fluctuations 
small v1 and small i2 are these two equations. Small v1 turns out to be small i1 times a parameter, a hybrid parameter, plus small v2 times another hybrid parameter. And so I write this v1 as h11 i1 plus h12 v2. i2 similarly is h21 i1 plus h22 v2. And how do you identify these quantities h11, h12, h21 and h22? Well, as you can see from the equations, if you divide a small v1 by small i1, you would get h11 provided v2 were 0. Similarly, h12 will be small v1 by small v2 at i1 equals 0 and so on. But notice that in order to get h11 and h21, we have to set small v2 equals 0. So the output has to be ac shorted. Whereas to get h12 and h22, we have to set i1 equals 0. So the input has to be ac open. So that's another hybrid aspect for you. Uh, well, what about the nature of the parameters themselves? Small h11 is an ratio between a voltage and a current, so obviously it's an impedance. h12 on the other hand is a, is a number, pure number, it's a ratio of two voltages. h21 is also a pure number, but it's a ratio between two currents. h22 on the other hand is small i2 by small v2 at i1 equals 0, so it's really an admittance. So, this is what we have. Notice that H11 and H21 are calculated with V2 equal to 0. H22 and H12 are calculated with I1 equal to 0. So, output short and input open in the two cases respectively. Similarly, H11, as I said, is an impedance. H12 a voltage ratio number. H22 an admittance. H21, the current ratio number, and the lettering. Uh, before we go there, let's look at trying to understand this circuit that's sort of obvious from the original equation. On the input side, we have a voltage which is a sum of two voltages, so it has to be a series combination. And H11, I1 will be a voltage, and since I1 is the current flowing in the input terminal. H11 I1 can be obtained simply by using an impedance H11 directly. On the other hand, H12 V2 is a voltage, but it cannot be implemented by an impedance simply because the current flowing here has nothing to, to do with the voltage V2. V2, on the other hand, is a voltage on the other side. So, H12 V2 has to be implemented by a voltage controlled voltage source. Similarly, on the output side, you have a current I2, which is the sum of two currents, hence parallel. H2 to V2, H2 has to be an admittance connected in parallel, so that the current flowing through that branch is H2 times V2. Whereas the other term H21 I1 can only be implemented as a current controlled current source. So, as again, as in the previous cases, you have obvious names H11 is the input impedance HI, H22 is the output admittance HO, O for output, H12 is a reverse voltage transfer ratio so that's why it's HR and H21 is HF, the forward current transfer ratio. Okay. The reason why the H parameter is going to be very important in our future work is that circuit components like transistors which essentially takes in a current in one place and tries to produce a related current in another place actually is modeled rather well by the H parameter equivalence circuit. In particular, for the transistor, you can even use a very simple uh, effective model where even you can ignore the HR and HO and you end up with a much simpler final effective model. We will see that later when we study transistors and so on. But in general, for an arbitrary two-port network, you will have four of these parameters. Now that we have talked about the three basic kind of two-port equivalent networks, let us try to show one application at least. And for that, we are going to demonstrate an application of the wet parameter equivalent network. Uh, 
for a very familiar problem, in fact, a problem we have already solved once in a previous video, we are going to find out the current I5 through the resistance R5, but this time we are going to use a Z parameter equivalent. There is, of course, no black box here, but what we can, al we can always do is we can imagine a black box that suits our convenience. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a box which has this diamond entirely inside. The place where we want the current, that is the current I5, that is outside of our black box. Not only that, the input part uh, the contains the battery E in series with the resistance R0. All this is going to be outside my black box. The advantage of this, as opposed to Thevenin's theorem that we used in the last video to solve essentially the same circuit, is that there, if I change the battery resistance, for example, I would have to recalculate all the relevant parameters, that is V Thevenin and R Thevenin. Here, on the other hand, once I calculate the four Z parameters for the part which is inside the black box, I can manually change whatever is outside. I can change R0, I can change E, I can change R5. I, can, I will still be able to use the same values for the Z parameters. So, this is the way I choose the black box. The black box has R1, R2, R3 and R4 inside the bridge, the diamond part of the bridge. And the input side is where I am ultimately going to connect my battery and re input resistance R0. Battery is internal resistance. And the output side is where I am going to co connect my bridge resistance R5. So, this is my two port network. Now, I want to calculate the four Z parameters for this. In order to proceed, let me remind you that to calculate Z11 and Z21, we need to set I2 equals 0. That is, we need to open out the output terminal. So, the output end, you have connected nothing to it. I, of course, still need to find out V2, which means the voltage between these two terminals. But because nothing is connected here, no drop takes place. So, the voltage V2 is simply the voltage between these two ends. So, what I need to do is connect a current source to the input side. The current source I ensures that the input current I1 is equal to I. And for this precisely known input current I, I1 equals I, I need to figure out what is V1 and what is V2. Now, what is V1 is easy. When you are looking at this from this port, whatever is inside the black box simply looks like a parallel combination of two resistances, R1 plus R3 in this branch and R2 plus R4 in this branch. So, the effective impedance between the input terminals is R1 plus R3 parallel to R2 plus R4. V1 is simply I times that. And if you divide that by I, you end up with Z11. With Z11 is simply R1 plus R3 parallel to R2 plus R4. Here, I have just written V1. The voltage is R1 plus R3 parallel to R2 plus R4. In order to calculate Z21, we need to know V2. Since V2 by I1 is simply Z21, given I, I2 is 0, which we have already ensured. So, we need to know the voltage V2. To know the voltage V2, all we need to know really is how this current I is branching into the two parts, which of course is in inverse proportion to the resistances. And after that, R3 times the current to the upper branch will be the voltage drop between plus and this corner, the point mark plus and this corner. Similarly, R4 times the current to the lower branch will be the voltage difference between the point mark minus here and this corner. Difference between these two voltages will give you the voltage drop V2. And if you calculate the whole thing, this is what you are going to get. You should verify for yourselves using pen and paper that this is the correct result, which of course simplifies a bit to R2, R2, R3 minus R1, R4 divided by R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 into I. So, if you divide V1 and V2 by I1, that is I respectively, I end up with Z11 and Z21. So, the two Z parameters here immediately works out to be 
z11 is r1 plus r3 parallel to r2 plus r4 and z21 is the expression down below. So, two z parameters down, two more to go. Well, for this, I need to put i1 equals 0. That means the connection here is opened out. And remember, the current connection was really like this. So, v1 is the voltage drop between these two ends. And I now need to calculate v1 and v2 for a fixed value of i2, which I am ensuring by connecting my current source i to the output terminal. Note that the input and output terminal are really for our convenience, this designation of input and output. At least as long as you are doing this on paper, you can connect the current source either to the input or to the output, doesn't really matter. If you connect it to the output, this ensures that I2 is equal to I. And using the same kind of calculation that we did before, we can immediately show that Z22 and Z21 are given by these expressions. Z22, of course, is the impedance seen from this side, which is nothing but uh, R1 plus R2, this branch resistance, parallel with R3 plus R4, the resistance of the other branch. Z21, a very similar calculation to the one we illustrated a while ago. And this gives us the four Z parameters. Z11 and Z22 are these two re resistances, and Z21 happens to be just negative of Z12. And this is what the result works out to be. So now we have enough information to write down the full Z parameter equivalence circuit. We know the values of all the parameters here. So now for the final step, I want to calculate the current through R5. When I connect R5 here and of course the other part, the battery and R0 on this side. So that's what we are going to do. The external components are going to be connected back to the circuit. Now I need to find I5. Okay. This is slightly more complicated than the one we used for Thevenin uh, theorem in the last video, but not very much more. If you look at this branch, it's easy to see that I2, apart from the sign, apart from the fact that it's going the wrong way, is simply this voltage source divided by the net impedance at 2 plus R5. So, minus, that's for the direction, into Z21I1 by Z22 plus R5. That's I2. Now, why do we need I2? Two reasons. One of them is I5 is actually minus I2. That's the current I really want. We have not got the answer yet because I5, of course, now works out to be in term, what's, comes out to be in terms of I1. Z21, Z22 are already known. Well, how do I find out I1? I just look at the other loop here, the input side. Notice that the output and the input are two nice loops which you can directly use. And here on the input side, it's easy to see that we get I1, the current, is nothing but E, this voltage, minus Z1 to I2. These two voltages are in opposition, so you have to subtract them and divide that by the net resistance R0 plus Z11. So that's your I1. Of course, I2 here is already written in terms of I1 up here. So I just take that, push that in here, change sides a bit. Again, requires a small amount of algebra. But finally, you will end up with I1 into this whole thing is equal to E by Z11 plus R0. So this allows you to calculate I1 rather easily. It's rather simple, just a bit of algebraic manipulation once again. And now that I have I1, I can put it back here to get I2 and negative of I2, which means you just drop this minus sign, is I5. So I5 just works out to be ultimately equal to this quantity. So this was the result that we wanted. In terms of the four Z parameters which you have already calculated, I5 simply turns out to be this simple expression. And I can now use this expression without having to recalculate any one of these parameters, even if we change E or R0. That's the advantage of using a two-port network as opposed to a one-port network. Doesn't look like a huge advantage right now, uh, but later on you will see many, many situations where this input-output paradigm will be the obvious thing to use. Of course, amplifiers are a great example of that.
and there the two port networks will really come on their own. So in the next lecture we will see some connections between the various equivalents that we have figured out and some interesting results involving them. Until then, goodbye.